After watching this video, you should be able to describe the key components of the Wiggers diagram, which include looking at atrial, ventricular, and great artery pressures versus time, taking those concepts and figuring out what the semilunar and AV valves are doing, opening and closing, including heart sounds, looking at ventricular volume changes versus time, and correlating all that with the electrocardiogram, the electrical events of the heart. We can see at the top here we have the ECG, the pressures in millimeters of mercury. In this case, we're looking at just the left side, so we have the aortic, left ventricle, and left atrial pressures, and the left-sided valves, the mitral valve and aortic valve, and looking at left ventricle volume in mils and cardiac cycle phases. So what we want to do first is look at left ventricle pressure, and it's going to start to rise when the ventricle depolarizes and starts to contract, and it's going to peak, and, it's, and after repolarization, it's going to start to relax and fall. You see the pressure's falling here. It falls to a low level, and then it slowly rises, and there's an additional bump before the ventricle contracts again. And we just repeat because it's a cycle. Now, if we go and add in the aortic pressure, it's going to be falling and, and declining. You can see that here. And it reaches the ventricle pressure, and at that point, it's less than the ventricle pressure. It, it actually follows the, the same profile. There's a little small bump, and then there's the decline in aortic pressure again, and then it repeats. Next, we can see that the left atrial pressure, right at the same time the ventricle is contracting, there's a small little bump, and then it slowly rises until it meets the left ventricle pressure. In that case, it's greater than the left ventricle pressure and follows the left ventricle profile. There's a bump right before the ventricle contracts again. So that's generally what we see in terms of pressure changes during the cardiac cycle. There wouldn't be any difference for the right side. Just the pressures would be lower and the names of all the chambers and valves would be different. Now let's figure out the valves and what they're doing. And that's pretty straightforward if we know our principles of valve action. We see that there's a period of time where the ventricle pressure is greater than the atrial pressure. And we know that that means that the AV valves should be closed. So from there to there, the mitral valve is going to be closed because the pressure in the ventricle, in this case the left ventricle, is greater than the left atrium. Now during the rest of the cardiac cycle here, the mitral valve is going to be open because the left atrial pressure is greater than the left ventricle pressure. Now we do the same idea for the aortic pressure. We see from right there to right there, the aortic valve is open because the ventricle pressure is greater than the great artery pressure. In this case, the left ventricle pressure is greater than the aortic pressure. The rest of the cardiac cycle, the aortic valve is closed because the aortic pressure is greater than the left ventricle pressure, and we can see that clearly here, and it extends over um, back to where it opens again. This is very important because this informs us about heart sounds as well as what's going to be happening with volume and the cardiac cycle phases. So if we go and make a little space right here, Right where the mitral valve closes, that gives us the mitral component of the first heart sound. So when the mitral valve and also the tricuspid valve close, that causes some turbulent blood flow, and we hear a sound. That's the lub. Now over here, we can make another space, and that would be where the, in this case, where the aortic valve closes, and in combination, uh, aortic and pulmonic valve closure gives us the second heart sound, S2, the dub. And then it just repeats again where the mitral valve closes. So there's our S1, S2, S1. And those are really the only heart sounds that we normally hear. Okay, now just take a look at where the valves are closed. See where they have mitral valve and aortic valve both closed? The volume in the ventricle must not be changing because no blood's coming in and no blood's leaving. Now once the ventricle pressure exceeds the aortic pressure and the aortic valve opens, now blood can leave the ventricle and now the blood goes down in the ventricle because the, the blood is leaving, it's being ejected into the aorta until that valve closes again, this, the aortic valve, and now I have a situation where both valves are closed. And again, I have a period where the volume isn't changing. It's isovolumetric. Now I have a period where the volume is going to go up because I'm filling. It's actually going to go up rapidly. 
and then there's going to be a relatively longer period where there's not much of a, a pressure difference and the volume isn't changing very much and then the volume bumps up again like that. All right, so that's generally what the volumes look like. Now what we can do is we can take a look at what the pressures are doing to help us with, to tell us what the valves are doing and what the volume is doing and we can put that all together and we can predict what the cardiac cycle phases are from this. So let's do that. So what we have, if we start, we can see that the ventricle volume isn't changing, but the left ventricle pressure is rising because it's contracting, so this must be isovolumetric contraction. And during that phase, both sets of valves are closed. Now once the aortic valve opens here and the volume falls, that's going to be our ejection phase because the ventricle is ejecting blood into the, into the aorta, or if you're looking at the right side, the right ventricle is ejecting blood into the pulmonary artery. Now if you go and look at once the aortic valve closes, I have an isovolumetric relaxation phase again because no blood's coming in, no blood's leaving, and the pressure's falling because the uh, ventricle's relaxing. Now once the mitral valve opens, I have my early rapid filling phase, I have my slow filling phase, and I also have a late rapid filling phase, and that's due to atrial contraction or atrial systole. If it's hard to see the writing here, what I wrote in, what we can do is we can zoom in and take a look, and that's what the individual phases are. Now we can finish up the final components of the Wiggers diagram. We want to put in just generally the cardiac cycle. We know IVC and ejection comprises systole, and IVR and all the filling phases make up diastole. And remember, all that's with respect to the ventricle. Now we can look at electrical events and look at the ECG, correlate that with what's going on mechanically. And, and what we want to do is let's just go back to our pressures and let's extend and add a little bit before the ventricle pressure rises, a little bump in left ventricle pressure, and also add the bump in left atrial pressure. So we'll just do that. There we go. Because we will line up the atrial depolarization part of the ECG with the beginning of atrial contraction. Now, if that's the atrial contraction, the atrial systole right there, we know electrical events precede mechanical events, so we must have our atrial depolarization start before that event starts. And you see I'm drawing right here the P wave, my QRS complex, and I'm going to draw in my ST segment, and I have a T wave here, and then it just repeats. So we can do that again. There's the P wave, the PR segment, QRS complex, ST segment, and T wave. All right, and you notice that the P wave and the QRS complex and the T wave, they're all lined up with specific components. You see the P wave, the peak of it is lined up with about the onset of that atrial contraction. The peak of the QRS complex is lined up approximately with the onset of ventricular contraction or mitral valve or tricuspid valve closure. And the T wave is lined up with the peak of ejection. And that's because the electrical events have to start just a little bit before the mechanical events. So P wave is going to start a little bit before the atrial contraction. My QRS complex is going to start a little bit before ventricular contraction. And my T wave is going to start a little bit before the onset of the drop in ventricular pressure, which is the peak of ejection. So that then summarizes the key components of the Wiggers diagram, starting with the changes in pressure of the left ventricle, aorta, and left atrium, the opening and closure of the mitral and aortic valves, how that closure of those valves results in the heart sounds, S1, the lub, S2, the dub, the changes in volume that you can infer from what the valves are doing and the, as well as the pressure, and putting that all together with the cardiac cycle and electrocardiogram. That concludes this video on the Wiggers diagram.